Okay, so good evening and welcome to the Dennis Duncan Lecture 2020. Uh, my name is the Reverend Dr. Gillian Strain and um, I'm the CEO of the Guild of Health and um, St. Raphael. Um, so welcome wherever you're joining us from. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event on behalf of the trustees of the Guild of Health and St. Raphael and the Church of Scotland on this joint event. So the 2020 Dennis Duncan Lecture this year is given by the Reverend Ruth Harvey and I'm absolutely thrilled that she made time in her uh, busy life as leader of the Iona community to join us this evening and also very really grateful to the Reverend Dr Martin Fair who is moderator of what must be a very quiet year for him, 2020, the year of the pandemic in the Church of Scotland. So Ruth and Martin, thank you so much uh, for joining us through the wonders of technology for this uh, event. And thank you to everyone at the Church of Scotland and to my team to, who made tonight possible, and especially to Robbie Morrison, who's got the worst job. He's making sure all the tech works um, as well. So thank you to Robbie and uh, for running it. And thank you for joining us. I am gutted I can't be in Scotland this year. Our Dennis Duncan Lectures in Scotland are part of our annual cycle of events. We've had some wonderful events in the past few years. I'm really sad not to be there, but thanking God that we have this technology and we've had about six months to all get used to this so that we can have this event tonight. Um, and I know there are three or four times as many people um, registered for a ticket. I don't know the numbers that I'm speaking to right now, but um, it's sad that we're not together. Things are one, things are different when you can be in the same room as people and interact in a different way, but um, with higher numbers today, um, it's a different type of event. And what a time it is to be talking about health and faith in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, the worst pandemic we've had for several generations. And of course, our thoughts and prayers are this evening with those people who are affected by this illness, those who are ill, um, those who are key workers, and anyone who's impacted by the pandemic personally, um, through their bus business or their community. And of course, those involved with church ministry on the run up to Christmas. So um, the Guild of Health and St. Raphael, if you haven't heard of us, we've been around since 1905 and um, our one aim is to try to communicate and work with individuals and churches and how to make real the mandate of Jesus Christ uh, to make new disciples and to heal. And in each generation, we have been reimagining what that means, what that means uh, for individuals, for churches and for professionals. Since 1905, the Guild of Health has been promoting the healing ministry, but doing so in active relationship with medical and psychological science as well. So our aims have always been really ambitious. Um, it's sort of ushering in the kingdom of God via resources with a focus on the healing ministry. And tonight I'm also really excited to say that we are um, launching our new website. Don't go there yet. Stay, watch the lecture. Um, but and maybe afterwards, go and check out our new website on gohealth.org.uk. It's a new way we're going to be carrying out this heritage. And I'm really pleased to be launching this at our Scottish event, which the Scottish Church has such a long and important history in the healing ministry. So it's great to be able to launch today. And what are we launching? We're launching three new um, communities of membership. The first one is for individuals, the Go Health community, for individuals seeking to live faithfully in a complicated world where we have medicine and science with all sorts of different things going on. How do we live faithfully, uh, believing in Jesus Christ and the healing power of, of the faith, but in a world that contains medicine and science and all sorts of different pressures? We have CRISM membership for professionals, medical health care workers, researchers and thinkers. Um, publishing articles and running conferences at a high academic level, engaging what, with what healing means in a multidisciplinary way. And also our membership community for churches wanting to express the healing ministry is being launched today. It's a new one for the Guild, Healthy Healing Hubs, the Healthy Healing Hub project, where we will badge churches as places of good practice in the healing ministry, 
resourcing them to carry out this ministry, both online and in-person resources for the hybrid model of church we're all living in today. It's face-to-face, -face, but it's also online. So resources to support church leaders and church ministers with that. Also with mentoring and other support, we've got a prayer portal on the website for our members, for people to access, and an online community for peer-to-peer -peer support and the sharing of good practice. So the Guild of Health has churches all over the country. They are now transitioning into Healthy Healing Hubs. And we're in the early stages of working with both the Church of Scotland and the Church of England in identifying a number of flagship churches. And this really is the moment for churches to be engaging with health as a way of delivering its mission of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're in the middle of the pandemic. Normally, pre-pandemic, if I wanted to talk about health and healing and the church, I would begin by selling the idea, making the case, arguing that the church should be involved with health if it wants to grow and if it wants to help people. In many ways, the pandemic has proved that point. The healing needs of our community are just enormous. You don't need me to tell you that. And the, men, the British Medical Journal published an article a couple of months ago highlighting the importance of the ongoing mental health challenge of the pandemic. One quotation from that report, which has stayed for me, there is no vaccine for the mental health trauma of COVID. And we are in the heart of every community all around the world and I'm poised to help. What a time to engage with healing and mission. A government report was published just last week which published research into how local councils think of faith-based organisations now as a result of the pandemic. And there was an overwhelmingly positive reporting from local councils um, as to their work with local churches um, in the pandemic to answer community health needs, particularly food banks and mental health. And 71% of the local councils who answered this survey said they were keen to build on the work. This is a moment for the church to work with local councils in health delivery, not just as a service provider, but because it's the ministry we've been asked to engage in with uh, by Jesus himself. And finally, um, church, the, another recent survey showed that people are overwhelmingly more likely to engage with church at Christmas as a result of the pandemic. The need is so profound. And our faith offers deep, holistic healing. Healing is about the physical problem, the mental health problem, but probably most importantly, healing that can answer the deep existential crisis that this pandemic has brought. To so do look at the website, see the resources that are on offer, drop me an email if you're interested or want to know more information. But back to tonight, we have a fantastic speaker. So what's, let me let me tell you what's happening tonight. This is a programme. Um, in a second, I'll introduce Ruth Harvey. I'll finally stop talking and Ruth Harvey can deliver her lecture. That's what you're all here for. The moderator, Martin Fair, will provide a brief response to the lecture. And then we're going to go into time of Q&A. Please use the chat in Teams to stick your question up. And I will do my best to make sure as many questions as possible get filtered to our speakers. Um, if a question occurs to you while one of them is speaking, just put it in the chat. Don't wait till the end. If it, or if you've got a question already about this, this subject, stick it in the chat. Uh, don't be shy. And we will try and get as many questions to the speakers as possible, because that's where it becomes real. When we start to think about what they said and ask, how does this apply in our situation? The lecture tonight is being recorded and will be available through gohealth.org.uk in due course. The chat will not be, so don't worry about what you put on the chat. So now I'm going to introduce the speaker tonight. Um, as I said, it's a great privilege and um, an honour to have the Reverend Ruth Harvey speaking to us on this topic tonight. Ruth will be familiar to many of you. Um, she is a minister in the Church of Scotland and a Quaker. She's been a member of the Iona community for over 27 years, has served on several of its committees and has um, in the past edited uh, Coracle, which is the magazine of the Iona community. She is now the leader and is an experienced writer, preacher and trainer. Previous to Iona, uh, Ruth was the director of Place for Hope, 
a Scottish charity accompanying church, churches and faith community through times of challenge, change and conflict. So Ruth, thank you very much for agreeing to deliver our 2020 Dennis Duncan lecture, which has the title Where Healing and Reconciliation Meet. So thank you, Gillian. And um, can I extend that thanks to the trustees also of the Guild of Healing in St. Raphael and to the Church of Scotland for inviting me to give this Dennis Duncan lecture. It's an honour to be with you this evening, even though I can only see the beautiful faces of Martin, Gillian and Robbie, but I'm sure you're out there somewhere, folks. I'd like to dedicate this lecture to all who are healers and reconcilers in the world. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge that the work of my colleagues and friends in my two communities, in the community of Place for Hope and in the community of the Iona community, those who walk the path of healing and reconciliation daily. You are my inspiration and my hope. And as Gillian said, let us hold in prayer all of those who in these tough and tender times are longing to receive or to give, but are cruelly denied a healing touch. So my aim this morning is to explore with you the connection between healing and reconciliation and the space between where we may find total peace. <clears throat> I'll look at the language and some of the practices I've learned in my work in the field of faith based reconciliation and explore how this leans into and connects with the language and the practices of healing. For the former, I'll draw on my recent experience working with Place for Hope. And for the latter, I'll share a bit about the Ministry of Healing within the Iona community, looking in the process to two of my wise companions and friends who are also members of the Iona community. Place for Hope, as Gillian said, is a Scottish charity that accompanies and equips people and communities so that all might reach their potential to be peacemakers who navigate conflict well. Founded in 2008, there are around 25, I think, accredited mediation practitioners who all have a faith background. I've been a volunteer practitioner with Place for Hope since 2011 and worked for the charity since 2012 until May this year. They provide excellent training to equip faith groups to walk towards reconciliation and conflict. The Iona community, my second community, it is a dispersed Christian ecumenical community working for peace and social justice, the rebuilding of community and the renewal of worship. We run three residential centres, two on the island of Iona, including the Abbey, which has been recently refurbished, and then a Camus outdoor centre on Mull, and our third centre, the McLeod Centre, is currently closed for renovation. Our 200 plus members and our 1000 plus associate members commit to a fourfold rule of life. This includes daily prayer and study, accounting for the use of our time, our money and our resources, and working for peace and justice. We have a weekly service of prayers for healing, which is now shared online, and a global prayer circle for prayers for healing. In COVID times, our community meets online, stripped of the opportunity to be in each other's company, yet very much being in each other's presence, sharing still a depth of vulnerability and compassion across the globe in ways not so far experienced. So despite the horrific context of COVID, there is something deeply liberating and refreshing about the new ways we are discovering to touch the lives of all, to quote one of the prayers of the Iona community. I've been involved with the Iona community all of my life, having lived as a member of the resident team with my family when I was a child in the 70s. And I've been a member since 1993 and leader since June. So that's a bit about me and my communities. My core question this evening is this. How can we borrow between the language and practices of healing and reconciliation to reach for a deeper, a total peace? How can we borrow between the language and the practices of healing and reconciliation to reach for a deeper or a total peace? And it's on this thread of curiosity and inquiry that I would like to invite you to walk with me this evening for a short while. 
And I'd like to invite you to notice as we travel how your own thread, your own journey into the Ministry of Healing or the Ministry of Reconciliation weaves its way into a shared pattern of shalom or salam or total peace. So a bit about the Iona community and its prayer ministry. In Praying for the Dawn, a resource book for the Ministry of Healing, Kathy Galloway and Ruth Burgess say this about the Ministry of Healing within the Iona community. Since its beginning, the Ministry of Healing has played a vital and central part in the life of the Iona community. The healing of broken bodies, painful memories, divided communities and nations, the healing of the earth itself and of our relationship with it are all part of the integrity to which God calls us. They are all part of the ministry of healing. I've witnessed this ministry active in prayers for healing on a Tuesday evening in Iona Abbey and through peace protests at Fast Lane Naval Base where he people like Helen Stephen, Reg Cumley, Peter MacDonald, Jan Such Pickard and others, some present with us tonight from the Iona community have risked arrest for the healing of the nations. As a child, I regularly joined in with the Tuesday evening service of prayers for healing in Iona Abbey. Nested within a weekly rhythm of prayers for justice and peace, the celebration of Holy Communion, a welcome service, a service of prayers for commitment. The service of prayers for healing was part of the normal rhythm of life. I learned that as much as we need to pray for justice and peace, so we need also to pray for healing. Towards the middle of this weekly service, which continues today, if virtually, those present are invited to walk forward and to kneel and to receive the laying on of hands and prayers for healing. Others are invited to gather round each of the kneelers and in turn, lay our hands upon those requesting prayer. As the circle of prayer moves on, these are the words that we pray together. Spirit of the living God, present with us now, heal you in body, mind and spirit and free you from all that harms you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Along with the laying on of hands, we also on a Tuesday evening offer prayers by name for those for whom prayer has been requested. And we bring before God those places or situations in need of healing. Before I go any further, I wanna just mention quickly a few words about the use of language. And I thought it might be helpful if I shared with you some of the definitions I've been using of some of the key concepts, if only to illustrate how blurred they can become. So this word healing, I've mentioned it a lot in relation to how we in the Iona community use it. Typically, this word is understood as, and I quote from, I think, Wikipedia, physical or psychological recovery from injury or trauma. There'll be many other definitions out there, and I look forward to hearing more from yourselves. But you'll already notice that the, in the Iona community, we include the notion of reconciliation within the definition of healing. And that's already a challenge and an intrigue to me in this journey. Reconciliation is understood as the collective process of peace building. Within some traditions, the Roman Catholic tradition in particular, reconciliation is also a sacrament, giving the nod to all of us to see reconciliation as a holy process where God is present. The words confession and forgiveness will come up, crop up later on. And for me, these refer to the daily, regular, maybe weekly cycle of acknowledging brokenness. I confess to my brokenness, to the ways in which I wound the, my life, the lives of others and the life of the world is the daily confession we offer to God in the Iona community prayers. And we seek forgiveness for the part we have played in that brokenness, either alone or collectively, receiving then the forgiveness from each other and from Christ. And restorative justice is the other phrase that I'll touch on towards the end. And my understanding of this is that it is a process of collective confession and forgiveness, 
which is recognised as part of the larger healing process where both parties leave the conflict or the brokenness with an enhanced sense of the other. So a few phrases and words that I realised perhaps needed some definition in terms of how I, how I might use them. Within the world of conflict transformation, there is yet another distinction which may be useful to outline at this stage. John Paul Lederach in his book, The Little Book of Conflict Transformation says this of the difference between conflict resolution and conflict transformation. At its most basic, the language of resolution implies finding a solution to a problem. It guides our thinking towards some set of events or issues, usually experienced as very painful, to an end. Resolution's guiding question is this, how do we end something that is not desired? And I wonder what the equivalent how do we end something that is not deny, desired? There is pain that needs to be healed with direct intervention, but there may be something else that we can do in the healing world to end that which is not desired. Transformation, Lederach says, on the other hand, directs us towards change to how things move from one shape to a different one. The change process is fundamental to this guiding language. And transformation's guiding question is this, how do we end something not desired and build something we do desire? Within Place for Hope, we talk about being conflict transformation practitioners and we use that word deliberately, transformation. We use it to emphasise the work of total change, total transformation, along with the resolving or the managing of specific conflicts or arguments, we're reaching for a deeper wholeness. In the world of healing, I wonder if this notion of transformation points to the practice of responding to total pain, a notion that I was introduced to by one of my friends in the Iona community and that we'll explore a little later. So I'd like now to move to consider three movements in the journey towards becoming a reconciler and to ask, to what extent do these movements resonate for those of you who inhabit the world of healing? These three movements are reconciliation within the self, reconciliation with the other in relationship, and reconciliation with the whole of creation. So firstly, a few words about reconciliation with the self. Within Place for Hope, those who express an interest in becoming a conflict transformation practitioner are invited to consider this flicker of intent as a discernment process towards a ministry, a vocation or a calling. Parker Palmer, a Quaker writer, says this of vocation. Vocation is not a goal I pursue, it is a calling that I hear. Before I can tell my life what I want to do with it, I must listen to my life telling me who I am. John Paul Lederach draws on the wisdom of Palmer, introducing us to the notion in the context of conflict transformation, to the notion of voice walker. In his chapter on vocation in The Moral Imagination, The Art and Soul of Building Peace, Lederach says this, People who are close to home, no matter where they live or what work they do, are people who walk guided by their voice. They are voice walkers. And Lederach talks of the vocation to peace building being a total experience of body, mind and spirit. This resonates for me with words spoken by Archbishop Justin Welby at the launch of the Reconciling Leaders Network in 2017. When he said, if the church is to have any authenticity in the work of reconciliation, we must be reconciled reconcilers. We must be people who are completely reconciled to God or en route. We won't get there in this life. We must be reconciling to each other. And essentially, we must share that reconciliation with the world 
so that they see what Jesus does to change lives. I'd like to stress the en route nature of this journey, that, that authentic voice walkers in the Ministry of Reconciliation are those who are continually on a journey of inner reconciliation with ourselves and with God. The daily worship of the Iona community nudges me always to continue the ways, continue to notice the ways in which my life falls short in confession and then to receive God's loving forgiveness. In Place for Hope, the eight day accredited training for faith based conflict transformation facilitators. The, in, in that course, the first unit focuses entirely on this inner journey. For some participants eager to get straight to the toolkit of units three and four when they learn about the art of mediation, this may be intensely frustrating. Yet our experience says that the quality of our work as reconcilers will be enhanced abundantly the more we embrace the ongoing journey of inner reconciliation in our own lives. In the 1970s, some of you may remember this, we used to sing, peace, peace will, peace will come and let it begin with me. Maybe we still sing that. It's remarkable how easy it is to forget this wisdom that peace begins with us. World peace will come when all of us, including and maybe especially our world leaders, admit our frailty, ask for forgiveness and change our behaviour as a result. This notion of the reconciling reconciler is a form of offering radical hospitality, first to ourselves before we can then offer it to the other. And in this I'm reminded of Henry Nouwen's work on the wounded healer and of the golden rule that reaches across all world religions to stress that loving our neighbour is begins with loving ourselves. It assumes that the starting point of reconciliation is self-love. My Presbyterian part of me doesn't always embrace that very openly. So healing begins with the self. Reconciliation begins with the self. The second movement is to do with the movement in, in the Ministry of Reconciliation um, to do with the mending of broken relationships. In 2019, I was involved as a Place for Hope practitioner in a quite a lengthy set of mediations with a leadership team in a local church. On the surface, the minister and the local leaders had fallen out over a perceived difference in approach to pastoral care. Not far below the surface, however, were glimpses of historical hurts, many of which had passed into mythology, personal tragedy, anxiety over perceived misogyny and power struggles, and diametrically opposed understandings of ministry. There was a lot going on. Into the mix came two of us from Place for Hope to accompany this group through a time of conflict transformation. I resolved as far as possible to empty myself in order to listen with the core of my being to the concerns and the hurts being expressed. I knew that some of what I would hear may disturb and upset me even though I wasn't directly involved. In my walking close to these tricky views, troubling views, views that I wasn't being asked to condone, but I was, I was walking towards behaviours that I was finding a struggle. Nevertheless, I was engaged on a very costly journey of deep listening, which meant losing myself in the views of the other, views that were far removed from my own sense of justice, peace and right relationship. This was a costly journey for me. The power of the costly act of deep listening of empathising with so much with the views of the other is evidenced in some of the greatest peace processes in the world. The Truth and Reconciliation Commissions of Rwanda, Liberia, Sudan, of Northern Ireland and probably most famously of South Africa are based on the participants ability to listen without judgment to the story of the other, no matter how distressing those stories may be. The task is not to condone and, 
and nor is it to judge. The task is to listen so deeply that we understand the other, even though we may not agree. My journey home that evening after this experience was in a deep fog in my head. It was almost an out of body experience. I had given myself over so deeply to the experience of empathising with the other that I was finding it a challenge to reground myself. This was an experience for me of radical, disturbing hospitality, of welcoming the other or the enemy right into my world. Even though we may find the behaviours difficult and are compelled to name and shame those if it hurts others, nevertheless, we are also called to look on the other with costly, extravagant compassion. This is not an easy journey and it's one that I'm just at the beginning of. So that was a few words about reconciliation in terms of relationships with the other. And thirdly, and then I'm going to introduce you to a video with two of my friends sharing a bit. Thirdly, I'd like just to say a few words about the healing of the nations, if you like, or reconciliation across global boundaries. The third movement in the Ministry of Reconciliation is the movement towards whole society healing towards culture change born first out of changed behaviours, which then lead to changed habits, which ultimately can lead to a changed culture. This is the journey of total transformation that Lederach speaks of. In 2014, I travelled to Nairobi as part of a Place for Hope partnership with the churches in Sudan and South Sudan and the Church of Scotland to offer training for trauma healing and reconciliation to a group of South Sudanese clergy. In preparation, I learned a lot about the history of how the land of Sudan and South Sudan was divided by colonial leaders between tribes, a societal belonging often overlaid with a religious identity. The good intentions of 19th century church mission from the West had meant that the tribes often identified with a denomination of the Christian church. Tribal warfare became associated with denominational warfare, a legacy for which we in the West must daily seek forgiveness. Despite this history, the churches in Sudan and South Sudan have become an integral part of the peace process there training and equipping mediators to stand between warring factions and war-torn communities, working visibly and behind the scenes together to bind peace into that hurting nation. While in Nairobi and then in Kanul in Perthshire, in the snow, I met Santino and Oruzu and Joseph and Alex and others who were committed to being faith-based peacemakers in their country and they thought of the snow as white rain. Working alongside the trauma therapist Sarah Whitaker Howe, the group was led through a process of naming and holding the physical and emotional trauma that they had experienced over decades, lifetimes. Traumas including death, kidnapping and rape, separated families, long-term psychological anguish, intertribal war and conflict. Over the next years, Sarah taught me that political peace can only be reached for through the lens of healing and trauma. And that this is a lifetime's journey. It's a process. It's a tone. It's an orientation as much as a moment of miraculous change or indeed moments of the application of technique. In March 2019, I travelled then to Juba, the capital of South Sudan, with Jenny Chinambiri from the Church of Scotland to meet our colleagues in their home country. We were there to assess and to commission the now trained reconcilers, trained through Place for Hope, although practising their mediation skills in a context wholly different to that of Scotland. As we were being driven through the streets of that war shredded city, Having the places of massacre pointed out to me as we passed bullet strewn walls, I was invited for a tiny moment into the world of trauma, threat and terror. 
At the same time, as I was introduced to the students of the Nile Theological College in Juba by Santino Odong, their principal, and as I was escorted through the streets of Juba by the ever smiling Oruzu, who had facilitated remarkable, you might say miraculous mediation sessions in his home in the eastern provinces of South Sudan, bringing warring factions together under the name of God. I was inspired, I was moved and forever changed by the magnanimity, by the courage, by the generosity and the grace which, with which they work as reconcilers in God's name. They saw their faith, their daily lives, their teaching and preaching and presence in the midst of conflict as part of their total calling to God's ministry, whether the ministry of healing or of reconciliation or both. This level of gracious, magnanimous living is costly. Most of those we worked with in South Sudan have families scattered in other safer parts of Africa. Children or el elderly relatives moved out to live and to flourish in the relative safety of Egypt or Khartoum or Kenyan refugee camps. This kind of ministry comes at a cost. These words of Donald Shriver sum up, sum up what I witnessed. He said, it requires a courageous and generous act on the part of a community that joins memory and moral judgment with forbearance, empathy and a commitment to a shared future with the enemy. So the third movement towards social healing, total healing of the nations. I'm going to pause for a few minutes now and introduce you to two dear friends of mine. I'm going to introduce you by a video. These are Elaine Gisborne, a palliative care physiotherapist in Leeds, and Ros Davis, a GP in Hull. Ros and Elaine are both members of the Iona community. They're both committed Christians and professional healers. In conversation, we have discovered that as in their journey into healing, body, mind and spirit, so in my journey into the world of reconciliation, there is a shared language and there are shared practices. Over to Robbie for the video clip. So Roz and Elaine, we've known each other for around about 14 years now as members of the Iona community. I'd, I'd love to hear you say a little bit about your own sense of calling or vocation to be a member of the Iona community and how your work in the healing profession connects with that draw, that vocation to Christian community. Roz, I wonder if you want to kick us off. Um, yeah, well, I think that, I mean, I can think of many, many things that draw me to the Iona community. Um, but I think that um, in this, in thinking about these themes, I think that one thing I'd say is it's a place where I can be myself um, and a place where um, I um, have a spiritual home, if you like, um, a, but not somewhere that's a cosy and comfortable home all the time. Um, somewhere where um, where it's okay to ask questions um, mm. and uh, and where um, where I think healing is not understood in terms of eradication of problems, but somewhere where there's space for um, pain to persist. Mm. Thanks, Ros and Elaine. Um, I think. What you said, Ros, resonates with me too. Um, for me, it was the liturgies, the authenticity of the language that spoke about the reality of life and almost lifted God away from the sanctity of the church building into God already found in, in the in, on the edges of society and in the world. And I think that's um, I think that's where my my belonging to the Iona community and my vocation. Um, through my paid work maybe meets because um, I think I've always been drawn to those edges. I, I'm thinking about this, I was reflecting that it was back in the early 90s when I uh, worked on an HIV AIDS ward and um, you know at that time it, people living with HIV AIDS were, were kind of shoved to the dark corner of the hospital building where you wouldn't stumble across them by mistake and I thought you know this is this is where it's at. Um, 
And I think Ros as well, you know, recognizing that healing isn't always found where where there is wellness and where there can be a cure. Um, and what does that look like? Um, mm. So yeah, lots of resonances. Mm. Thank yeah. you so much. And I just want to ask you each a question about your own um, your own take on this journey of healing and reconciliation. Elaine, we've talked in the past about how Cicely Saunders' idea of total pain inspires and I guess augments your vocation in the healing world. Could you share something with us about the impact that this concept has had on you as a palliative care physiotherapist? Mm. So um, just for a little bit of background, Dame Cicely Saunders is the founder of the modern hospice movement. And in her work, she, she recognised working with people who were um, predominantly at that time dying from a, a diagnosis of cancer that often their symptoms that they were displaying physically, whether that's a physical pain or um, maybe nausea, um, whatever physical symptoms they had, didn't seem to be responding to the normal traditional pharmacological treatments that you'd think people would respond to and began to understand and unpack this um, I guess the understanding that the pain is is complex. It isn't just about what we're physically feeling, but sometimes its cause can be emotional. It can be spiritual. It can be social. So um, she talks about meeting a lady who was in a lot of distress because um, she was dying. She was losing her role as a wife, as a mother um, in her paid occupation and, and recognizing the complexity of loss and how that manifested not just as a physical pain, but in distress, in angst, in fear. Um, and today in palliative care, we often, you know, we, we come across this very, very frequently and also not in palliative care. I think it's important to say that it isn't just um, when people are approaching the end of life that they can experience this. But um, if somebody's physical symptoms don't seem to be responding to physical treatment, is there actually something deeper that's going on here that that we need to look at and address? Um, so in, in a nutshell, that, that's the kind of concept of total pain. And within my practice, um, you know, I can look back over years of working as a physio, not in palliative care and recognising people that were exhibiting this um, for all sorts of different reasons, where actually there's an emotional cause of a physical pain. Um, and I think what's just utterly fascinating to me is recognising that if we can address that element that I want to call finding peace um, or reconciling ourselves to the situation that we're in, then physical healing can grow from that place. But where we're denying the reality of the impact that this situation is having on our physical, emotional, social, spiritual being, then we're, we're never going to we're, we're never going to be able to be authentic about addressing what's happening for somebody and to journey with them through that to a place of healing mm. or reconciliation. Mm. And that, I love that concept of of the kind of holistic approach to to pain that recognizing that pain can occur in all these different contexts, including you mentioned social pain, mm. and I guess that's the context that resonates for me with what I've heard you talk about, Ros. Um, and my question is this, I've got it written down. When we last spoke, Ros, you talked about your work as a GP amongst folk who are homeless. And sometimes you were saying that you've been offering care to the same individuals who are homeless for decades. What you said very much connected for me with some of the ideas that Elaine's been talking about, and also in particular the idea of social healing or social um, the, the, the pain that comes out of, out of society, I suppose. And this is something that our friends within the Corrie Mila community have talked about a lot. The healing of the whole of society, including those individuals who are hurting because of policy breakdown or economic breakdown. So I wondered if you could share a bit, a little bit more about your sense of calling to this kind of work of healing and about the place of the healing of memories in particular and of stories um, in that context. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, it's interesting how that really, for me, resonates as well with what you said, Elaine, about um, uh, as we're, we're whole people, aren't we? And I think that each of us can 
recognize in ourselves in our own bodies the the physical impact of the emotional um it's it's something that is a is a very real thing for all of us i think um I think that the thing which um, drew me to work in this area of medicine, um, again, a bit like the IONA community, I can think of lots of good reasons. Um, uh, but I think that one reason was a, a sense of injustice, actually, um, and recognising the inequality that there is for people, um, uh, for, for homeless people, the the average life expectancy in the UK is is something like 47 and perhaps lower than that for, for women. And uh, we're learning that if you live into your 50s as a homeless person, if you manage to do that, that you will um, probably have the, you're likely to have the frailty and the burden of ill health um, that you might otherwise have in your late 80s. Um, so so as, a, as a doctor, that kind of disparity and that um, inequality um, motivates me to want to um, try and make a difference as doctors. Um, perhaps if you'd asked me as a younger person why I wanted to to do this, I would have said something about wanting to make people better. And I think that that's um, a, a kind of simplistic idea about healing that I've um, come to understand differently as time has gone by. Um, uh, but I think that in those places where things are most difficult is actually that's the place where it can be most rewarding to work as well because when people have little um, it doesn't take very much to make a difference to make things better so it's a rewarding thing as well as um, uh, something which can feel very harsh and unjust. Um, I, I think that um, uh, interesting to interested to think about what you said, Elaine, about um, that about getting close to people at their point of need, um, their point of pain, um, because I think that that's where that's where healing happens. Um, is that that's when we um, when we meet people at that point of need, and when we are met by God at our place of need, that that's where, where there is a place for healing. Um, so for many of the people who I work with that, um, uh, the their experiences and their stories um, are stories of trauma and, um, and often abuse. Um, so, so it feels, I'm, it feels a privilege to, to hear some of those stories, um, but they're not asking. Um, a story isn't actually something I think I would ever ask for because I think there's a real um, there's a privilege, um, and I would accept it as a gift. But I wouldn't seek it out, in fact, um, because I think that um, there's a real risk when you come close to people's pain um, that there's a responsibility, I think, to make sure that that's handled very gently, um, just as the gentle hands of the physio um, would um, be looking after somebody's body very carefully. I think that we um, have a real responsibility to really respect people's um, places of difficulty in their lives when that's psychological and emotional um, because I think there's a real risk that you can re-trigger um, distress um, when stories are retold actually um, and I think I think perhaps that um, often I think that the the healing that I see in the work that um, I do um, in homelessness is actually that it's far less in any medical intervention or prescription or drug or anything like that. But um, again, just as we know in our own lives that it's the very um, the basic needs that we have that feel most important. So showing someone that they are valued by listening, um, uh, showing respect to people, um, those feel much more to be places of where healing can happen. Mm. Um, 
And I think that links to about hope for society. I think thinking about your question about hope for society, I mean, that's quite a and healing of societies. That's a that's, that's quite a tall order. <laughs> what a question. Um, but I wonder if there is a link here as well, because I think that, you know, we just as we can't we can't solve every problem and we can't um, we can't um, mend every wound there is in our society. But what we can do um, is continue to meet with each other with at those very um, at those places of need. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so in in listening and respecting in in feeding and clothing and housing, um, because that's where we have our needs met and that's so that's where we find healing. Sure. Um, so if we do those things, then then there's hope for healing of society for me. Thank you so much. And I guess um, as someone who's worked in the field of reconciliation, I don't bring the expertise that you do, but the language that you talk of. So Elaine, when you when you talk about the, the reconciliation with the self, it really resonates for me with the sense of the wounded healer or the reconciled reconciler that in order for us to heal others or to bring reconciliation to the world, there must always be an inner journey of of reflection and, and continual prayer and, and reflection and learning about what is it in me that is wounded that I, and that needs reconciliation. Um, so how, to what extent am I on that journey? Um, so that's what your reflections offered to me. And Rose, the holistic and um, societal context in which you work also points me to the, the notion of the healing of the nations, that there is um, such a a task for us to do to see the whole person within society's brokenness, not just within the, the medical context in which a person operates or is treated. Um, I guess I want to just come to the end by sharing with you, um, as you were talking, Ros, I was reminded of words of um, John Paul Lederach about the notion of, of a voice walker. And I think you both speak to me as people who are voice walkers. He says this, this is people who are who live their calling. You may notice voice walkers first for the things that they don't confuse. They don't confuse their job or activities with who they are as people. They don't confuse getting credit with success or recognition with self-worth. They don't confuse criticism for an enemy. They don't confuse truth with social or political power. They don't confuse their work with saving the world. They don't confuse guilt with motivation. And in that he's saying that, you know, people who are called to the task of healing or reconciliation are the people who walk the talk, who sit with the homeless, who touch those who are close to death or the end of life. And I guess for me, without getting too pious about it, you resonate for me as people who are voice walkers in that sense. And I don't know what your sense is um, as we come to the end of this conversation of that notion of, of vocation into this task of healing or what the journey between healing and reconciliation says to you, what that what those two um, notions, how they resonate in you um, in your in your life as a physio, first of all, Elaine, any any final thoughts or words around that? Yeah, loads. Um, <laughs> I think drawing from what what you've both said, for me, I feel so deeply privileged that my profession allows me to physically lay my hand on somebody and to explore with them um, what what happens when I when I touch the bit that hurts. And whether that is a physical part of the body or whether that is an inner wound, whether it's a, a relational wound in in your work, Ruth, um, I, I think it's that meeting place. It's that interaction where um, one person is willing to be made to, to feel vulnerable and expose themselves and to risk that that the other person in, in the meeting them in that place can be a good thing. And I think that goes back to to what Ross was saying about sometimes, you know, we have to tread really carefully here because we don't want to cause more trauma. We don't want to cause more injury or damage. So it's about, you know, the, the challenge to me is always to to make sure that what I'm doing is is for their benefit, not mine. And, and that constant challenging, you know, 
what's my motivation here? Mm. Um, so that's one big resonance is about where, where two people meet with the intention of seeking reconciliation and wholeness. Um, and I'm careful with using the word healing because it's such a loaded question. Um, but what does healing look like when we cannot be made well? And that, that's a really big question. And that's about transformation and expectation and language, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't always have time with our patients to explore these in a depth. So sometimes it's about saying that this is enough. Mm -hmm. You know, a small touch um, is enough. An acknowledgement is enough. We don't have to, to seek whole, whole complete healing. Mm -hmm. But somewhere along the journey is what's really important. Um, and I will always, I always carry with me um, those words when I when I first started working in palliative care, and um, was quite overwhelmed by the task. And um, the person who was chaplain at the hospice where I was then working said to me, "Look, Elaine, you know," he said, "You don't have to have all the answers. You, this is about you journeying with another person, and you will share together what you both know, and out of that will will grow from that." The, the path you need to tread together. And I think that is so important. You know, I have some knowledge, very little knowledge, but my patients know themselves so well. And it's about the two of us coming together and finding the path that works mm. in that moment for that person in that time. And I think that's that's the, the wonder um, mm. and that that's the creative space. So mm. it's about courage, uh, it's about trust, it's about willing to to want to, to be in a better place. Um, mm. And and whether it's physical healing or, you know, emotional, it, 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 yeah. we're all complex. So, yeah. And that notion of transformation, the whole the holistic, um, the, 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 the healing, if, if we do use that word is in a sense, more than the sum of its parts, it's it was a there's a total healing, if you like, that 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 can occur when there's an emotional and a spiritual mm -hmm. and a physical healing. Ros, any final words from you on that whole link between healing and reconciliation? Yeah, I think um, I'm sure you must have seen it many times, Elaine. But I think that it's 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 interesting how sometimes that you see you you observe reconciliation, for example, in in family relationships um, uh, at a, a great depth when there is when the physical body is beyond what we would understand as being healable. Um, so sometimes I think there is a there is a different sort of tenderness at that point that can happen. Um, and that's about reconciliation, but also about healing at that deep level. Um, I think that thinking about vocation, um, I think it's it does really make you think about um, about that idea of how privileged we are when we are in these spaces with people, um, and undoubtedly um, we gain far more than we could ever give, most definitely. Um, so I think that actually perhaps vocation is about um, our healing and about this. It takes us to where where we meet um, God in our need as well. Um, so that's what I was. That's what that helped me to think about listening and to I think, you. Yeah, saying. I think the notion of vocation as a, as a vulnerable path that it kind of exposes us to our own inner need and weakness and we're part of that journey companioning ourselves as much as companioning the other and all of us being companioned i guess by by god um, listen thank you so much um that, that i know that this is an ongoing conversation that the three of us will continue but i'm going to press the the stop button for now thank you thank you so thank you robbie for for um, guiding us through that video. Um, so much in there for us to reflect on. Um, let me just scroll to my notes. So just a few words um, as we come to the close of this, this part of the evening. 
Lederach, in his book Reconcile, Conflict Transformation for Ordinary Christians, reminds us that in his ministry of reconciliation, Jesus did not focus so much on teaching mediation techniques or on outlining clear steps to success. Jesus' ministry of reconciliation, rather, had its roots in grace, expressed prim primarily through the quality of presence. The way he chose to be present in relationship and in the company of others, even those who wished him harm. It's this focus on right relationship as much as on best practice that I see in the lives of Elaine and Roz. Elaine talks about the complexity of pain, that it has emotional, spiritual and social causes, and that this complexity often manifests itself not only in physical pain, but in fear and anxiety. So she is led to ask the powerful question, is there a deeper cause that needs to be addressed? In the work of conflict transformation, the practitioner notices the data of trauma and conflict and helps those involved to sit, albeit uncomfortably, with the pain and the discord of broken relationships. This presenting data often appears above the surface of the iceberg, if you will, and is usually visible to all involved. It represents that visible position that the individuals in a conflict may take in public. But these presenting issues are rarely the whole story. There is usually a deeper cause that needs to be addressed. <clears throat> and it's the work of a conflict transformation practitioner to ask Elaine's question, what is this deeper cause? So that is to find the, 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 the role of the transformation practitioner is to find good, emotive, focused questions that help the participants look below the surface, below the presenting position, to probe deeper into the core interests that lie under the surface. This is often the place of memory, of hurt, of emotion, of repeated behaviours and of strong, perhaps denied emotions. Elaine says that it's in this place where we address the emotional cause of a physical pain that we may find peace. We may come upon ourselves authentically addressing the reality of our situation. In listening to Roz talk of the injustice she witnesses as a GP and the shocking life expectancy statistics if you're homeless, I'm struck by the same combination of compassion and prophetic witness that I noticed in my South Sudanese mediator friends. Motivated by a faith that requires us to work for justice in the world, Roz, along with Aruzu, Santino and the others, are prophetic witnesses to the calling of Christ to be healers, not just of the body, but of the whole of society, where the poorest are provided for and where systems of injustice and conflict are turned on their head. I was struck by the articulation of the place of faith and how that has a part to play in the work of both Roz and Elaine. They are both voice walkers, making visible their healing vocation, not only in the words that they speak, but also in the actions that they take. And they're unafraid to walk towards the difficult places. As Roz says, the places where things are most difficult can be the most rewarding places to work. Getting close to people at their point of pain, that's where we meet people at their point of need. And that is where we meet God. The same courage is, of course, needed for voice walkers in the Ministry of Reconciliation. Courage to walk towards situations of pain, of anger, of broken relationships or war or conflict. And yet it's in this place, at the heart of hurting communities, that we'll find Christ the healer, Christ the reconciler already at work. Both Elaine and Rose talk with tenderness about the gentle touch that is needed when hearing the story of another or coming close to the pain of another. A story isn't something I would ask for, says Ros. It's a privilege and a gift, but I wouldn't seek it out. And Elaine talks of the tenderness of touch, seeking permission to hold the hand of someone who is dying rather than assume permission is given. In this COVID world where so many crave touch, these reflections are all the more poignant. This dynamic is mirrored for me in the work of conflict transformation when great care is taken to ensure that any stories shared are treated with respect and with confidentiality. Which means that while the wisdom from a story may be shared, the attributable content may not be shared. With these sensitivities in place, 
deeper vulnerability may be offered, which in turn may lead to a fuller, more whole reconciliation. In conversation with Elaine, she introduced me to the concept of total pain coined by Dame Cicely Saunders, the founder of the modern hospice movement in the 1960s. Total pain is the recognition of the holistic nature of pain and the interplay of psychological and social well-being, spirituality and culture. Symptoms rarely occur, says Janine Brandt, in isolation. Rather, they cluster with other symptoms and are influenced by the psychological, social and cultural characteristics of the individual. Borrowing the language and the experience of faith based health professionals has given me new insights into the world of the Ministry of Reconciliation. So I'd like to draw my reflections to a close with a few final words about the commonality between healing and reconciliation. In her analysis of this commonality, Genevieve Parent says, common assumptions informing peace building practices and reconciliation processes locate peace in political institutions and other top down understandings of peace and reconciliation. Common understandings of healing and recovery locate peace within the individual's psychological and emotional dispositions, offering a bottom up view of peace and reconciliation. Debates over the qualities of top down or bottom up approaches seem largely unproductive. Instead, she says, I suggest that it is in the uncertain and indeterminate space between individual healing and political reconciliation that one should find and build peace. In this liminal space between healing and reconciliation, I wonder if there is therefore a common language that can help us all to find and build peace. For there is no doubt, as the world turns the corner into 2021, with COVID still rampant, with Brexit on the horizon, with Scottish elections in May and COP26 in, in November, reminding us that all of creation is groaning in pain, there is no doubt that our world needs healers and reconcilers in abundance. There are three stages in the work of reconciliation that have resonances with what he, my healing friends describe. Best on base best, based on best practice, but also based on the root dynamic that draws believers together through the story of the passion and resurrection of Jesus. The first stage in the work for total peace is to offer one another permission to grieve, or as Brian Cox says, the freedom to wail unencumbered with expectation. In a process of mediated reconciliation, this freedom takes time and it takes skill to generate. Safe enough space needs to be created for those in pain to express their grief, their rage even, at the pain of separation. The skill of building rapport, offering reassurances, outlining clearly the process being entered into, gives confidence to the parties that it's okay to express a range of emotions. And the ability of the reconciler to sit with this range of emotions is an essential, essential part of the mediation process. This grief at the pain of an unwanted diagnosis or of being shoved to the edges of the hospital ward is mirrored in the grief and the lament of the passion of Jesus, in the betrayal, the suffering, the death and the devastation of Good Friday. The second stage in moving towards total peace is the need for intentional repentance. The stage in conflict transformation may take time. This is where the skill of the mediator to draw out a story of separation or of hurt relies on the art of finding good questions, being willing to go over the same story from multiple perspectives. And it's in this space that healers like Ros and Elaine work to ask, is there something deeper going on that needs to be addressed? It's in this space that mediators, reconcilers work to ask, what are the core questions that must be addressed? Whose story needs to be heard? What are we learning about that which divides us and that which draws us together? What have I heard that has unlocked a new understanding in me? The waiting time, having courage not to rush for the eradication of the problem, but to dwell in the not knowing, is mirrored in the indeterminate waiting of the disciples on Holy Saturday. Healers and reconcilers alike are often called to resist the urge to rush. 
And the third stage in the reconciliation process, the stage of working towards restorative justice, is mirrored in more conventional mediated reconciliation by the stages where we begin to develop options for the future to decide on a way forward. Within this process, we may begin to imagine a new future together, not a future free of pain or conflict necessarily, but a future where the courage and the compassion to sit with each other's stories is increased and the kingdom of God is thereby augmented. This process of restorative justice is one where the emphasis is on mending relationships rather than on focusing on the laws that were broken. This hope and possibility of restored relationships is mirrored in the celebration and the tentative raw steps taken on Easter Sunday towards a new hopeful world. I think I've said I'm closing three times now, but this is the real time that I'm closing. I'm taken back to the words of John Paul Ederach, focusing on the art of conflict transformation as a holistic process. He says this, transformation directs us towards change, to how things move from one shape to a different one. The change process is fundamental to this guiding language. And transformation's guiding question is this, how do we end something not desired and build something we do desire. A way forward for those of us engaged in the worlds of faith-based reconciliation and healing is to open the door to borrowing each other's language and practices in order, as Genevieve Parent says, to enter into the uncertain and indeterminate space between individual healing and political reconciliation, where we may find and build peace. This is the total peace or the shalom or the salam that Cicely Saunders speaks of, and a language that I would in my reconciliation practice like to borrow if I may. I'll end with these words from the great mystic, Leonard Cohen. His song, Anthem, contains this off-quoted lyric. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Sorry, I can't sing it. A bit like the Japanese art form of Kintsukoi, where ceramics are mended with gold lacquer. This, these cracks, this song of Cohen, reminds me of this great wisdom. And this is what he says of his own song. There is a crack in everything that you can put together. Physical objects, mental objects, constructions of any kind. But that's where the light gets in. And that's where the resurrection is. It is with the brokenness of things. Thank you. Ruth, thank you so much. Um, normally, if we'd been all together, the room would be full of applause. And it'd be all normal. I would stand up and ask people to keep a moment of silence. Um, just a moment to dwell on what you've said. You began your talk by saying you want that you were going to uh, show a shared the threads of a shared pattern of shalom and I've got this image in my head that we're all our computers all over the world and we are global there's people from all over the world joining in there's sort of threads linking all of our computers our workstations together and you've connected um, deeply into people's experience I, I running the guild I'm always saying you know healing is not getting better and you've just put it so beautifully, um, really the breadth, the height and the depth of, of what healing is. It's global, it's personal, it's vocational, it's costly, it's about listening. We're on a journey for helping people and ourselves find total peace, but it interacts with practitioners all the time. Thank you for articulating that with such deep uh, storytelling and authenticity. Um, and we've had lots of questions um, coming in. I know you haven't been looking at the chat. We've had lots of very uh, positive feedback just saying, you know, this is speaking to me and thank you. And this connects with me this way. Um, and there's a whole heap of questions. So I'm going to try to get through them. I'm going to ask our panelists a question. So as you know, we, you were being joined on the panel today by uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Fair, um, who um, is current moderator of the General Assembly, served as Minister of St Andrew's Parish Church in Arbroath and has a long history on top of all this of working in mental health provision, um, starting projects um, where he saw gaps. So um, we're delighted to, to welcome 
Martin onto our virtual panel with his theology, his hat as a moderator, but also his experience as well. So the first question, let's I want to start with. Let's start with some practicalities with a really good question coming in um, from Shirley. Um, which speaks to how do we how do we engage in reconciliation or healing authentically, but doing it safely? She writes, sometimes people do not recognize that others have to come to terms with their lives as they live them and can put pressure on them to seek healing. This can cause anguish and we need to consider whose needs we are trying to meet. So how do we engage? How does the church engage in the healing ministry, that, that path, that three point pathway that you presented? How do we do that safely and authentically on the ground? And as you're thinking, and as you're thinking of your answers, let's start with Martin was just going to offer some reflections on on the lecture, first of all. But there's the first question we can be mulling over in our minds as he speaks. Martin. Thank you, Gillian. Um, I did have a look at the Q&A and the, the questions were flowing in, so that's good and we'll hopefully have time for plenty of those. So with that in mind, I, I won't speak for too long. Um, but first of all, my, I add my thanks to you, Ruth, for what you've shared here tonight. Uh, you spoke about the, the authenticity uh, of your friends, Roz and Elaine. Well, let me tell you, that's what comes over from you. Uh, in, in bucket loads, uh, a voice walk or someone living out their calling. And that's why you have uh, garnered respect, not because you are the director of this or leader of that, because of who you are, uh, an integ person of integrity and authenticity. So thank you for that. Uh, you did say you were going to finish three times, uh, but hey, once a preacher, always a preacher. Um, you started by saying you could only see the beautiful faces of Martin and Robbie and Jill, and you could have stopped there. You had me won over right at that moment, uh, but thank you for continuing. I'm glad that you, you introduced us to Roz and Elaine, who are both professionals, as it were, in the field of healing. Too many times I've been exposed to conversations about healing, which seem to want to divide um, medical healing, if I can put it that way, that's to do with doctors and medications. Some people want to put that on one side and then talk about healing in a spiritual sense in another side and as if never the twain shall meet. Uh, and I think I've even been party to discussions or conversations where some people, well meaning I suppose, are almost disappointed when somebody is uh, helped by a doctor or by the application of medicine, they, they they feel it would have been more dramatic if that hadn't worked and God had intervened. But why do we need to make this division? And uh, and I think you illustrated that beautifully with your guests that you that you brought to us, Roz and Elaine. At the same time, let's always have room for God in this process. I read uh, a blog post today which said this about the, the the two vaccines that now seem to be showing the most promise in relation to COVID. The blog was headed up this saved by science, saved by science. Now I love science, I give thanks for scientists day by day, but there's more isn't there? There's more to healing than what science alone can deliver, I'm sure of that. You spoke about your two communities, a place for hope. Uh, I've been part of Place for Hope training, and uh, I, I, I can say without fear of contradiction, it's just the best training uh, I ever was part of. It's the refusal to look at issues and problems and sweep them under the carpet. Oh well, let's just hope. Let's just hope if we ignore it long enough, it will go away. Uh, that's not what Place for Hope is about, and ultimately, it's not what reconciliation is about. It has to be more than just wishing that things went away. And I've been on, on Iona on Tuesday nights to be part of that healing service. But let me say this, especially in more recent years following uh, some pretty uh, traumatic injury myself, I have known the prayers of the Iona community. And for those, uh, I am very 
very grateful indeed. A wee word about reconciliation and why wouldn't it be absolutely central to our vocation and to our calling as people of faith? Doesn't it flow out of God, God uh, in the beginning? Uh, I love the verse in, in Colossians where it says, God in Christ was reconciling all things to himself. Not this or that, not humans only, but all things, the whole created order being reconciled. And so if this is the mission and the ministry of God, then wouldn't we obviously be want to be a part of it? That reconciled to God, that reconciled to ourselves and reconciled with other people. I think once to my great hurt in my life as a minister within the church, I had had a, such a sharp disagreement with one of the elders in my congregation. I was right, of course, uh, but it led to uh, a very sharp disagreement. And for some weeks, um, this gentleman would, would be in, in attendance in worship on a Sunday morning, but he wouldn't. He wasn't speaking to me, and essentially, I suppose I wasn't speaking to him. And then, after about a month, I realised that that's not enough. I mean, we weren't in open warfare, but the cessation of hostility isn't enough. We need to reconcile. And so I reached out to him and to cut a very long story short, we became in the end two very close friends because we were prepared to work it out. We weren't prepared to leave it hanging. And in the end, this man shortly after that developed cancer and died within eight months. And I was the person that journeyed with him through his closing days on this earth. That for me was the nearest I've known or perhaps the most profound experience of re being reconciled to the other so that in the end we could journey together through the most important parts. You talked about South Sudan by way of societal healing, and I love that work. Um, but speaking now for, for, for the Scottish context, you know Ruth and I know well, much remains to be done right here by way of societal healing and reconciliation. So I could listen to your talk again tomorrow night and the next night and still be drawing more from it, but for now, I think with those few comments, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and allow Gillian to go back to uh, chairing the, the Q&A. Gillian, back to you. Thank you, Martin, for your comments. And I felt exactly the same. There's just too much in it. It was too rich. And I look forward to listening to it again. Um, so let's go to one of our first questions there. Talking practicalities, Ruth, first. What would you, what would you say to somebody wanting to engage more fully in the Ministry of Healing as informed by the Ministry of Reconciliation, how to do it well, how to balance authenticity with good practice and um, safety for, for the other. So, so thanks both uh, Gillian and Martin for those words. Um, really, really great to hear some feedback. It is weird not <laughs> hearing any anybody out there. So it's good that you're there and, and good that others are there, including Shirley. What a good question. And I think I noted, Shirley, that, that you'd also asked whose needs are we trying to meet in that question? And I think that's a question that Elaine also was asking. Um, of course, there's a there's never a, a neat answer to any question, but I think that's a good one to ask. Um, and part of the authentic um, journey is, well, you know, we're actually trying to meet our own needs to notice what is it that God is calling us to. But when we encounter the other, um, especially in the work of healing and reconciliation, the core needs are those of the other um, and or of the relationship. You asked how we engage in um, reconciliation or healing authentically and doing it safely. I mean, on one level, and maybe you're way beyond this already, so forgive me, but on one level um, is to notice when we're beyond our own capabilities. And I've come across that awareness many times as a reconciler that to recognise that actually I need I need help here. I need to bring in somebody else who's got the skills, the accreditation, um, the recognition, um, and you know, 
through the Guild of Health, through Place for Hope, through other agencies like these, we can find people who can either offer the healing and the reconciliation or can offer the training. Um, I'm not sure if that was where your question was going, but that's my response. Gillian, any, any or Martin? Yeah, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. What is your response to this? Well, I tend to be a, a, somebody that wants to be intuitive and just to say, well, it will just come naturally to naturally to you. But but that's only half the story. Absolutely, we need to understand, you know, that training and uh, and learning in this whole field are really important. Um, that's why we have safeguarding and why we take that so seriously, because we understand that it is, even by well-intentioned people, it's possible to do harm. So when we're in the business of working with individuals in the business of healing, let's remember that we're dealing uh, with, very, with very precious things. And I, the, the very first time I ever held a baby was the first time I had to conduct a baptism. I mean, I just didn't do that whole goo goo baby thing, you know, I left that to my wife. So there I was my very first Sunday morning. Uh, it was my first Sunday morning as an ordained minister. And the, the, husband, you know, the couple came forward and, and I was to take the baby and suddenly for the first time in my life, I felt myself holding this, this my goodness, this precious thing. Well, don't drop it, don't drop it. When we're alongside people who, are, who have been hurt or are hurting, uh, and therefore, there's healing to take place more. Just think of that. Think of it as that very precious baby that we're going to take the greatest possible care with. So that's just a metaphor, but maybe it's helpful to some extent, as well as the learning that comes from those who are expert and there are experts in the field. I was very struck in your in your lecture, uh, Ruth when you were describing a, when you were really doing deep listening around reconciliation and you described it i, I wrote it down I, I hope it's right you you said something it, it was radical disturbing hospitality which sounded like it was deeply exhausting and costly for you and i remember a time i did a, a healing service um at a, at a, a large church it was a cathedral and um a similar experience of listening to people who i will never meet again so it may be different in that way their name and their hurt, the name and the problem, the name of why they're there, the name of what's wrong and, and feeling so exhausted. You know, I forgot to look both ways when I was crossing the road as I was going home. It was just I was exhausted afterwards and in a way didn't even think I could make it home. I was so I had all these stories in my head. Um, and, and I wonder if you could say more about um, what you think's going on in this listening. Uh, what makes it healing? And if I could add on to that, um, Andrew's asked a really good question here. Um, he wants to ask around healing and the need for human touch. So, you know, in our COVID times, what do we do about touch, whether it's laying on of hands, a formal healing service, or just naturally wanting to touch somebody that's hurting? He's written one of the Dutch Iona community members told us recently there's a new, a new term in the Netherlands which translates as skin hunger. You think the yeah, end therapeutic touch is so important. Um, so how would you respond to that? What's going on in deep listening and healing? And how do we do it when we can't touch in COVID? Mm -hmm. uh, go to Ruth first, then Martin. I mean, I know that there is wisdom in this room that we'd be able to respond to that question with much greater clarity. What I, what I know that was going on for me at that time was, yes, radical, disturbing hospitality. It was deeply uncomfortable. Um, it, it, because I was being asked to carry something that was, in my own worldview, really damaging. Um, so I think we have to take care of ourselves in that space. And I, I went for some um, for some um, supervision after that session, which was essential. And it was and there was um, an element of spiritual direction in that supervision, which I found immensely healing for me. So there's something about you asked what 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 makes it healing. Even with the other whose views I, I found so so hard, there is a reciprocity, Gillian, which then I mirrored in my spiritual director where I took that pain. And I think there's something about the shared um, the shared pain. Um, I knew that this individual whose views I found difficult actually was expressing some deeper trauma. I'm pretty certain from an earlier part of his life that he was unable to to share. And and um. 
so but there's a reciprocity and I found I was I, I, I guess what I was expressing which was so costly was love actually um, and I hope that doesn't sound flippant or glib it, I guess it, that's what it felt like um, it was radical costly and we had a fantastic um, Bible study last night in our community gathering from a chap called Craig Gardner um, from the Baptist College in Cardiff and he 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 spoke to us in the evening about prodigal hospitality and by that he meant reckless hospitality the hospitality shown by the father for the returned son the kind of reckless abandoned hospitality that just gives and gives and gives so there's something of that um and i think you know for me i'm a kind of baby reconciler in the sense that not that it gets any easier but i think you get better at looking after yourself um what makes it healing i don't know it's that it has to be something to do with that depth of love and beyond the beyond the horror of what I saw, it was the depth of caring and also the reciprocity. Um, and yeah, skin hunger, Andrew, Annie, um, I love it. What I, go with go the Dutch? <laughs> I'd love to hear it in Dutch. What is it in Dutch? Somebody will tell us. Okay. Martin, would you do you have a response to these questions around touch? I think so, and, and perhaps by an illustration you alluded to in your opening remarks, Gillian, introducing me to some of the work that I've been involved with and for many years. My congregation has run projects for people that have struggled with addiction, with mental health problems, homelessness, isolation, just people that are really left out, people that are absolutely on the margins. And I'll never forget um, on one particular day I, I was in the project and, and this chap came in, he was he was well known to us. This particular day he was off his face on every illicit substance known. Um, he was just in a mess and you know there was all sorts of guns running out his nose and his mouth and and he <laughs> I mean, if it was a modern day leper, then this was it that just walked in our door that day in the project. And I absolutely felt it in myself, this, you know, this revulsion almost, you know, this drawing back. And Tracy, who heads up her project, saw him coming in and just walked over to him and threw her hand, her arms around him and cuddled his face into her. And all I, you know, all I'm looking at thinking, well, all that grot and stuff. I mean, this is pre COVID. This is years ago. It was all over her. But the touch. Was what spoke that day more than anything else. Now, here's the bit which I think makes it healing. Tracy herself. Would tell you that even a couple of years before that moment she could not have dreamed of doing that and would not have acted in that way not for one moment but she herself is healed she herself is in a loving dynamic relationship with jesus so in her hug and embrace that day Jesus showed up. That's the only way I can put it. And that's how somehow how it becomes healing. Yeah, I love that Jesus showed up um, a bit as well. We could the scientific explanations of what happens when people listen well. Neuroscientists might say it's because of our mirror neurons get firing. When somebody really listens to us and that boosts our immune system, the scientific explanations, but you know, what better than you know Jesus? Um, showing up and that's often when I'm working with churches about developing a healing ministry I start with well, I don't start with the healing service um, I start with a welcome at the door um, you know how does that go down at uh, mums and tots group you're dealing with maternal mental health um, old folks lunch you're dealing with loneliness you know the, you, churches have extensive healing ministries they might not call it healing ministries um, but it's the th thing, and I, this report I mentioned earlier called Keeping the Faith that was released by the, a government all-party um, group last week, um, identified, were surprised 
with um, how local ca ca local camps were surprised at how much they could work with churches because they already had the networks and they were responsive and they were agile. We've been doing this for years and it's vital healing ministry. Local councils might call it, you know, um, service provision. We might call it, uh, you know, it's Jesus showing up. Um, uh, it's all down to the language, isn't it? I've had lots of questions. I'm having trouble keeping on top of them, I have to say. So, um, but I want to turn just a little bit um, away from COVID and um, some of the broad questions and focus down a little bit into um, healing and maybe delve into um, often reconciliation in churchy kind of language. It's about guilt, sin, confession and getting better. That's part of the language we have in the church. Whereas um, sin and guilt isn't perhaps a pressing image um, issue for many people. It's most it's shame. Um, I read an article recently, you know, the pressing question for most people is it is not am I going to get to heaven, but am I worth anyone bothering with? So this um, pervasive um, problem of shame in our society, uh, which has fueled the Black Lives Matter movement, it hides people in abusive marriages, it traps people in addiction and all sorts of negative patterns of behaviour, just shame. So how does Ruth first, the, um, the path of, um, of of what we can learn from the healing of the ministry, the, I'm sorry, the work of reconciliation help us address shame when it comes to the healing ministry. So Ruth then straight to um, Martin. Wow, that's, that's massive. Um, and first of all, I completely understand that, you know, the, the language of confession and forgiveness for me takes me out of a place of, um, it's taken many years to get there, but it takes me out of the place of guilt and sin um, as uh, and shame. Um, but I recognise that that language still resonates for so many um, as, a, as a starting place of, of, of fallenness. And I suppose I'm taken to the words of Matthew Fox and the original blessing that we we can choose to begin with blessing, but that's you know it's very hard to to slough off the 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 history that we're that we're given over over decades, years, lifetimes, and um, so in terms of how we move on, I would I would fall back on you know trusting the process in terms of reconciliation and and as a reconciliation practitioner, if threads of shame and guilt and sin um, rise to the surface, then that's the data that we work with and we work in a very confidential way and in, hopefully in a very compassionate way to help those with whom we're working talk through the impact of their shame on themselves and, and explore for themselves what, the, what this has meant. We're not counsellors, um, those of us who are trained as, or not all of us, some people might also be counsellors, but when we go into the work of conflict transformation we don't pretend to be anything other than conflict mediators, if you like. So it's also important to recognise that this, you know, these concepts which we can hold in the context of a mediation and hold in the context of a difficult conversation, we may also um, need to, to recognise that, that there are others who can who can work with the deep implications of ingrained shame um, that often those of us in the churches are culpable of pouring onto people. Um, Either unintentionally or sometimes even um, intentionally, and I and I rest in the in the in a I choose to rest in the theology that begins with blessing, um, but that can sound very glib for those who are weighed down with the with the sense of guilt and shame. Martin, I'm going to defer to you on this large theological topic. Take it away, Martin. Well, listen, you um, you give sway to no one when it comes to uh, the theology of Ruth, so so keep on. Um, I'm trying, I'm taking back to Bonhoeffer when um, when it comes to shame because he he begins ethics with with a really serious treatment of the concept of shame and he talks about it as being endemic almost. Um, I'm not sure I'm not sure it's a social construct. I think it's deeper than that. And yet you're absolutely right, Ruth, we have at times and can still um, pour it on top of people. And maybe there's a power dynamic going on there somehow. But I'm not sure that the solution to shame is a kind of modernist sort of thing where we say to people, 
no need for that. You're great. Um, you know, do you know what I'm saying? There's something deeper. And I think it, to me, the image of it goes right back to Genesis and Adam and Eve and whatever's going on there. Um, the sense of shame that they feel when out of relationship, when in some kind of broken relationship with God, shame comes into that. So I think shame is a reality, something we need to deal with, uh, face up to, uh, and not try to diminish in any way. But what we do with it then is really important. Rather than using it as a thing to make people feel bad about themselves, maybe again point to Jesus. How many of the folk who came uh, to Jesus did so in shame and, and felt themselves unworthy? The woman in the crowd who didn't even want to face Jesus, but thought just if I could just touch his cloak, perhaps. And Peter himself, Lord, I'm unworthy, you know, get away from me. Somewhere that's about shame, but Jesus, Jesus was there in those moments. So that's not an answer. It's just off the top thinking about it. Um, it's there. How do we deal with it? I like I like both those answers because there's um there's a theological position. Um, we are separated um, from God. There's sin in the world, but there's a kind of practical pastoral implication. That this is about starting point. How do you um, open up the conversation? When I read recently, um, one in five adults between 18 and 74 suffered abuse as, as a child, defined as sexual abuse or domestic, all sorts of abuse. And the um, adverse childhood experience um, research has shown that traumatized brains are just wired differently. So they're scanning all the time for danger. So your entry point as, as a healer or a reconciler is so important as well to get that language right. Well, well, not have, as Martin, you said, you know, not, not, not be entirely postmodern about it, say nothing matters because it really does. Um, and I think our world needs confident messages from the church right now about what we believe. You know how radical it can be saying, you know, pray for healing. We think it makes a difference. I've been in I've been in clergy training where they've written that down. <laughs> so, you know, they, they might forget it. You know, we have to find that. Um, OK, so change of topic. Alex has asked a, an important question, I think, um, about broadly about spiritual abuse. Um, he writes or she, I'm not sure. Is there a way in which language and processes of reconciliation could help those who have been hurt by faith-based healings and for that reason struggle with the concept of healing ministries? He, um, Alex writes he's, um, that um, Alex is thinking particularly of LGBTQ plus folk and conversion theories, but more broadly um, the, the large amount of people that have been hurt by the authority of the church broadly or in particular by healing ministries which have poor theologies. How can the language of reconciliation help Ruth? Wow, another huge area, Alex. Thank you for the question. Um, I mean, I think going back to Martin's response to the last question and really to what Elaine said, always there's a there's a deeper, bigger question to ask. Where is this pain coming from? What where do we need to go together to um, to find the peace that we need? So I guess borrowing the language of reconciliation. So the first thing to say would be that while no individual is ever neutral, the mediators are trained to be impartial. So we would come into a situation where there was hurt and anguish expressed around, um, you know, the, the, the hurt um, that you describe, Alex, for of people who've been hurt by the churches historically through um, sexual abuse or through misunderstandings or in sexuality. We would do our best as reconciler, reconciling practitioners to come um, to create a safe enough space. You can never guarantee complete safety because things might get really hairy, but in the conversation really tough. But we would create with the with the folks involved a safe enough space to share the depth of the hurt that has been caused. So that would be the first thing. It's like the lament that, you know, the first stage in the process, spending time allowing the individuals to express the grief and the lament and the rage, um, and then finding a way with those individuals to take that grief and rage to the other. 
Um, so that takes a while. Um, you need to work with, in a sense, in, in a mediation, you'd work with both sides of the of the conflict to get to the place where you could be in each other's company and express that, um, if that was what was desired, express that grief and hurt to the other. And I guess the important thing to say is in a mediation process, um, that the aim is to bring two sides or two individuals to a place of, of some kind of reconciliation. Um, if, it, if there's another process that would go on coaching or mentoring to just work with an individual on a, on a process. But if you're wanting to come into the presence of the other, that who um, holds all the, the um, who, who represents the pain and the grief and the rejection, then we would work hard to find ways to um, express the vulnerable hurts and pains that are there that then need to be taken to the other. And then along with that would be, well, what requests do you want to make? What what are you looking for in that um, face to face meeting with the other? Um, so I can see a parallel journey um, where I, I think, you know, sometimes the healing ministry of the church might be too too weighted sometimes with language of, of, of religion, which has itself been part of the cause of the pain. Um, but we're never, none of us ever immune from, from causing pain. And I'm reminded of what Roz said about taking care of people's stories and memories um, and never taking that lightly. Um, the gentle touch of somebody's story is as crucial as the gentle touch on request um, if you want to hold somebody who's in pain. So that would be my starting point, Alex, but it's a conversation to be continued. Martin, over to you. Probably not much to add to what you've said, Ruth, there, which was really, I think, quite comprehensive. But maybe just one one other thing. When someone has been hurt by the church, uh, abused spiritually or, or one way or another, I think the first thing we have to say is sorry, even when it wasn't us. You know, I mean, I think it's quite tempting at times to say, well, that was another branch of the church, perhaps, or, you know, that was that was someone else. Well, for the person that's been hurt in that way, I'm not sure they're differentiating <laughs> by which denomination or where that happens. So um, as part of the universal church, then maybe the very first thing to say is sorry. And um, well, we're seeing that worked out all the time at the moment, even, even just recently. Um, you know, parts of our church being accused of being more concerned with their own reputation than with the the plight of, of victims and so on. So anything that steers away from owning up, saying sorry, accepting, you know, is a bad starting point. So there and then what Ruth said. This is the penultimate question. We've got a biggie to end on. We're going to talk about COVID at the end. But before we get to COVID, and um, how the church could respond practically. I want to ask you both um, around where other therapies, complementary therapies, might sit alongside um, the healing ministry. So we've had two people ask questions about that. Stephen has asked, um, he belongs to the Church of Scotland and a prayer group. Uh, he's also a certified thought field therapist, which is related to tapping technique. Um, which um, helps people around trauma. Um, Helen's also asked around complementary therapies as well. In your, um, from your perspective, how might these sit alongside the healing ministry and um, what would be good practice for people what, looking for some guidance in this area? So uh, Martin first, then Ruth. Go, right, go the, the other way this time. Hey, just mix it up. Um, I'm I'm absolutely open. I really am. Um, I believe that Christ is in all. Um, again, referring back to the work that my congregation does with really seriously broken people. Um, I have seen some amazing movements in the right direction, some absolute healing going on through what might be broadly uh, termed as alternative therapies. Um, hypnosis and so on. Um, we have somebody in our volunteer team back in that project, very committed Christian who uses some of these therapies, who is trained accordingly. It wasn't just a, a whim of his own to think maybe I could do this, um, acknowledging that these things are real. Now, at the same time, 
I know plenty of people who I respect greatly who, who get very suspicious about anything that's sort of alternative uh, and out there. They maybe want to commit much more purely to intercessory healing and so on. Um, I see that, but for me, um, I've seen too much evidence of how God can be at work through through a variety of techniques and so on. So personally, I'm quite open. Um, but again, I think just as for uh, a counsellor or so on, you, you want somebody who's properly trained and understands. So it is if it's somebody who's going to be using other therapies. It's somebody who understands, is trained, educated and so on, rather than somebody who just read a book yesterday and then considers themselves to be an expert. Um, but yeah, generally I'm open. Ruth? Well, at the risk of seeming facetious, uh, Martin, I wouldn't want any, you know, the clergy have just read a book about the latest theology, and then go off and preach. We also have our duty of care to our poor parishioners who get landed with, with anyway, I won't go down that route. But um, I guess I don't think we've even scratched the surface of the ways in which we, we can heal ourselves, the world, our relationships. We haven't even scratched the surface. So like Martin, I'm completely open to, you know, exploring all people of goodwill who are seeking healing in any way, um, however far fetched it might seem in my mind. And that's crucial for me, I guess. There's always the challenge of what's, you know, what, what's in my um, sphere of, of understanding and I might be very limited. So I, I, I think I need to come to the world of healing and I hope I do with the ability to, to and the willingness to be surprised by the Holy Spirit not knowing what might happen and how um, any any approach to healing might might bring um, bring healing. So I think for me that's that, that's the starting place. I don't think we've scratched the surface and I've never heard of thought field techniques and I will now look that up. Thank you so much for that invitation. But I think the key thing is rather than looking to the binaries, what's in and what's out, I have also experienced um, I've had disturbing experiences in more conventional healing contexts when I've not been clear what the intention of the healer has been. And I say that advisedly. Perhaps a more honest um, telling is that I, I was afraid that the, the intention was was other than, than healthy, other than for the healing of the individual involved. And I've been very disturbed and, and concerned about that. So I think there's not a binary what's in, what's out. I think intention is important. I think openness to the, the surprise of the Holy Spirit um, is, is crucial and and keeping that openness and that willingness to be surprised. And the question understand even more. So thank you for that, Gillian. Um, I think it's a great question as well. I personally have, have tried all sorts of different things um, and certainly uh, in the Guild, I like to think of it as um, sort of the healing landscape and on the landscape we've got medical science um, and, and thank God for that. Uh, we've got the, the knowledge of psychological and therapeutic language and we've also got the um, more holistic therapies. Um, and uh, sometimes people say, you know, where does a Christian spiritual healing sit on this sit on this landscape? Is it over on the medical side? Is it on the because you talk about science sometimes? Is it on the alternative? Um, and and I, I love the vision both of you've drawn up as, you know, it's got to be authentic and we've got to be open to the Holy Spirit. Um, but I think what we can offer as, as Christians is is the one thing you will never get on a magazine shelf, you know, January. You know, 2020 beach body ready your best year yet you know you know we we offer the one thing that none of these therapies can offer and that's an understanding of death uh, because we preach christ crucified which ultimately has to be uh the most important healing we can offer it's the elephant in the room nobody ever mentions it but we've got as far as i'm concerned um the best understanding of suffering death and uh, suffering and death in this life and that's what we can ultimately offer to people on the healing landscape. Nobody else does that. We have got six minutes left if I do a 30 second wrap up at the end. Um, I want to end with the church's response to COVID. Penelope, I love your question. We love all that. We appreciate the theology, but how do we address the practicalities? It's a great question. Um, so the, I would like to answer, ask you both in two ways, given we've got the moderator of the Church of Scotland. How does the church nationally 
address the healing needs of our community and our nation going forward at this time. And secondly, how can churches on the ground, individual communities, practically um, work in the myriad of healings that is now needed as we attempt to recover over what will probably be many years in, of the coronavirus pandemic? Okay, Jillian, i um, try to do the first one first of all. When certain sections of the church in America uh, cheered on by the soon to be former president, we hope, um, were rushing to be opened. Someone for whom I have great respect, Shane Claiborne, said, let's have churches as the last places to open as an expression of how much we care for people and want to protect people, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, this balance between having our churches open and continuing as uh, digital communities is a very, very complex one and, and difficult one to manage for sure. Having our churches close to people is a huge hurt for many. And yet, I will not preside over anything that might you know, allow us to become some, become some kind of super spreader. So, looking after and caring for people is first. Let me just tell you what I personally am going to be involved with, and this is by way of the National Church. It's a project with two of our artists within the Church of Scotland, Peter and Heidi Gardner. And we have a national project very soon to be launched. So watch this space, you Scots people. It's called Scented Lament. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but the herb rosemary is long associated with loss and lamenting and remembering. So when this project is launched, we're going to invite people who have experienced loss in any way, whether directly through COVID, a bereavement, or whether it's because you, your wedding was postponed or you didn't get to graduate or you, know, you didn't get your prom leaving, whatever it was, something that was lost. There's going to be an opportunity for you to send in a sprig of rosemary and then Peter and Heidi are going to weave these into a beautiful Christmas wreath, uh, not made out of our usual holly in the ivy, but made out of rosemary. And then when these are gathered in from all across the country, we're going to mount this uh, in Edinburgh uh, just in the week leading up to Christmas and it will span us into the new year. And it's called Scented Lament. Uh, and the scent of rosemary gives us this opportunity to express our loss through COVID. And so there'll be much more about that coming up, but it seems to me one thing that the National Church is going to offer as a simple means by which people can express what they feel themselves to have lost or have lost in this last year. Ruth. What a wonderful thing, and, and um, I look forward to hearing more about that, um, Martin. Thank you. I mean, just two things to say, Gillian, before I hand back to you. One is um, that within the Iona community, we have been worshipping together, first of all, weekly on a Tuesday night and now monthly. Um, and we have discovered new spaces to share. It's not the same. Um, it doesn't replace face to face in, in each other's company worship. However, it is something that is new and we pray always in the Iona community and um, this is not we're, not, it's not we're not unique in this, we pray to find new ways to touch the lives and the hearts of all. I think we found a new way in the in the agony of COVID, we're finding new ways to be church and this is something that we have to embrace as we go forward. And um, the second thing is to say um, is, and I'm, I really will end with this, this is not my first of three endings, Martin, <laughs> um, that I was speaking to a friend today who has just retired um, and I said to him, as you do, so what are you going to do with your, you know, with your retirement? He said, without a, without a hesitation, I'm preparing for death. This is a theologian who's taught theology across the UK um, and has been a church leader. And he said, I'm preparing for death. And I was slightly startled. And then he says, I hope it's not coming soon, but that's my task. And I guess in a sense, that is all of our task, those of us in the Christian world, to prepare for death and the life beyond death that we so believe in and that gives us the resurrection hope while we're alive. So 
Preparing for death for me means living every single minute, every single minute to the full, even in these COVID times. That's tough. Um, and I don't say that with any um, lightness of touch other than to say that, you know, I take my my lead from him and say that, you know, let's let's live each each moment as fully as we can um, in this horrendous con COVID time. And can we get a bit of that scented lament? So that sounds fantastic. Thank you for that. What a wonderful image. Um, Gillian, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Back to you. Thank you for that, Ruth. That's a beautiful way uh, to wrap up and end. And that scented lament thing sounds amazing because it's, it's a whole body thing. It's involving all your different senses. So the Guild is sponsoring um, a thing down south for our English listeners uh, called the Leaves of the Tree, which is an installation in large buildings of leaves with the word hope riven through. And the idea is each leaf for each person that's died. And it's it's a point, it's 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 an installation to allow people to reflect on where on what they've been through and what the hope might be. And certainly in the Guild, um, with the launch of our new communities, we're trying to both resource people on the ground, both ministers and individuals to engage in the healing ministry, but also create space through the Go Health community um, to learn from one each other, one another, to pray for each other as well, because as you said, it's tough to go through this. Um, Moltmann's definition of health is, um, which just resonates with what you both said as well. So Moltmann's definition of health is the power to live in bodies that sometimes go wrong. So health is all about the power to live with whatever we're going through at the moment. Um, and that's one of the think I think the great gifts of the healing ministry. It's this it's the realism and its practicalities all bracketed under the power of the resurrection and the power of our faith. Ruth, thank you so much. Um, I don't think Martin was joking, perhaps I need to listen to it all again. I, I was particularly conscious of that. So I was trying to look at the questions as well. But thank you so much for the richness of what you've offered and new avenues. I work professionally in the healing ministry and I kept thinking, oh, I've never thought of that. Oh, that's good, <laughs> you know, need to follow up on that. So thank you for that. And Martin, thank you for giving us your time and your reflections and your support for the project. And thanks to you, everyone who's joined us uh, tonight. It will be available online at some point uh, in the future once we finish editing it. If you want to follow up on anything that you've maybe heard or missed, if you feel a question wasn't answered properly, uh, then do get in contact with me through the website gohealth.org.uk. So good night. God bless you all. And um, thank you once again to our speakers and everyone who made this event possible. <laughs>